Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's Scene on 7. I'm Steve Brennan. Not to be outdone by the fantastic fruitcakes of last week, you have responded brilliantly, as always, to the appeal this week for chocolate cake. And here they are, if you'd like to have a look at those. I hope you can see our, our wonderful chocolate cakes. And I'd particularly like to thank Mrs. Pina Morris, known to her friends as Mrs. Kipling, for these lovely items here. The idea of homemade soup being sent in was suggested, but I'm not uh, sure that the Royal Mail would approve of minestrone pouring out of an envelope or a jiffy bag. Now, if you can tear yourselves away from 101 interesting things to do in a Range Rover, one, here's what's coming up in this week's programme, Seen on 7. Bicycles going nowhere in the observatory, Steve Highland has more. The mad, mad world of Terry Vision, accompanied by Susanna, bringing some sanity to film views and videos. A welcome back 1994 style. We welcome back Bob Owen and Nick Wood with this week's Police File. What on earth is Simon Brandt doing climbing a rope? Is he escaping from scene on seven? No, he's in the crystal maze. And as a special supplement to Scene on 7, this week we have a special film all about the nave at St. Margaret's Church in Uxbridge. Something to also look forward to after the programme, we have an additional treat for you. Andrew Barron's film celebrating an amazing five years of perhaps the funkiest church anywhere. Of course, as you saw in the film there, I'm talking about the nave. It's located at St. Margaret's Church in Windsor Street in Uxbridge, and the Reverend Alistair Cutting will be here in person in the studio to discuss the story of its success. All right, now the crew and I are going to need some exercise after all this chocolate cake. Maybe we'll get on our bikes. And some brave souls did that recently at the 1994 cyclothon. It was all for charity, and quite literally, we sent Silvertastic Steve Highland along to find out more. Thanks, Steve. Now, if like me, you've actually got to lose a little bit of weight, what better way of losing weight is to do it for charity? We're at the Cyclothon 94 in the Observatory's shopping centre in Slough, and we've got six teams behind us that are raising money for the Mayor's charity. Let's find out a little bit more about why they're doing it and who they are. The last cycle gone raised just under a thousand pounds. We're hoping to raise a lot more with this particular one. It's all going to the mayor's charity. Where's the money going to go? It's going for the breast cancer screening appeal, which is run by the Snow Observer. For the simple reason, they haven't got any money to get it back on the road. The women of Snow are being deprived uh, of that particular scanner. So I want to raise the money to get it back on the road so that the women of Snow can put their fears at rest. Now, currently, the actual scanner has, has been used around the London area, isn't it? And it's been used in London to raise money to get the equipment and make sure that it's kept um, equipped properly and funded. But that means it's not seen to the women who really raised the money in the first place. So therefore, I want to raise the money in Slough for Slough women to bring it back and make it permanently in Slough so we, we don't lose out. It's the second cycle of on. How did it all start? It all started in October 92 when the observatory shopping centre opened its second phase and we were wanting to raise money for the community and the idea was hatched for that purpose and to raise money for the Mayor of Slough's charity. Now tell me, how do the different teams actually succeed in winning this? Now they're going to be cycling now for something like six hours. They are they? indeed cycling for six hours and they last achieved nearly, uh, nearly 300 miles. So we're, we're going for that as a record and a target. We've got some of the same teams that we had last time, so they really do know what they're in for. We have the uh, Observer, the local newspaper. We have the Express. We have Montem Sports and Leisure Centre, which is in Slough. So they've done it before. We also have the Slough Police, wishing to be referred to as the Moody Blues. <laughs> taking part in today's uh, charity opportunity. So 
Well, it's going very well here. Who we got? This is um, Hersham Grammar School. What's yeah, your name? Uh, Simon Webb. Simon, just how much sort of practice have you put in for this? Um, not much on a bike. I've been running quite a lot, but I'm just discovering that that is the wrong thing to do. It really is a stamina event, isn't it? Yes. Uh, very much so the leg muscles, the uh, lungs. Uh, what other sports do you do? Uh, hockey and volleyball. Maybe. Well, you should be all right. Good luck on that. Uh, let's find out. The boys in blue here at the moment. Uh, what's your name? Andy Green. Hi there, Andrew. I mean, the rest of the guys must think you're a raving man to be doing this on a Saturday morning. Well, they're all working, so... <laughs> cycling to do, raising money for the Mayor's charity at the Cyclothon 1994 at the Observatory in Spain. Looked like a lot of fun. About 18 months ago I did a cyclothon also for charity, mate, and couldn't walk or even sit down for about two days afterwards, so I know how you feel. So if any of the participants are watching, I know exactly how you feel and well done for raising all that money, going through the pain barrier, and all of it went to the Mayor's charity. Many thanks also to everyone at the Observatory in Slough for their assistance. And I'm delighted to welcome our very own Silver Fox, Steve Highland, to the studio. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. Steve, we started back a long, long time ago well, in, in the radio, world of radio land, beat, mate, yes. when we didn't have to dress for the programme. Absolutely. Of course, that hasn't changed for me. It's every morning, it's radio. And I must, that... The thing that strikes me about all of this is, of course, the circus of people that you bring with you when you do anything like that. It was a lot of fun, but... Uh, when you're looking at the camera, there's half a dozen people all looking back at you. You just don't get that in the studio, do you? How do you, apart from that, how do you, how do you compare, how do you make the comparison between sitting in a radio studio, looking, look, radio studio, looking at the microphone and try and get your words out in one piece like I did there? <laughs> I think looking at, I mean, everybody says that when you look at the microphone, you're, you're actually thinking of a single person at the end of the day. Uh, but I Can think, you share that with us? Uh, be? Maybe not, just the moment, actually. <laughs> mate. Uh, mate. I think the camera actually is a strange a creature in itself. I know there's somebody yeah. behind it all the time, but you've got this one big black eye looking back at you, and it's it's unlike the microphone where you can actually get very close to it, be sincere and intimate with it. It's a bit like being in the uh, in the ring with Frank Bruno, isn't it? Having <laughs> one big black eye looking back at you. Indeed, it is. Indeed, indeed it is. But I mean, really, at the end of the day, you're in complete control in radio. You, you are the editor. You you have control of everything that's going out. But except your speech. Except your speech. Uh, whereas at television, of course, you're you're in a situation where you're you're depending on so many other people so to make you look all right. The cameraman. Yeah, and they still can't manage. Oh, they still can't manage. Can actually, does. they so do the best they can. <laughs> they do the best they can. Listen, uh, what sort of programmes are you going to be making for us here at WMTV? What sort of things do you want to do? Well, it seems like we're going to be going out and looking at some of the uh, different events that are obviously going around uh, at the moment. Uh, also, some investor to give. You've got to be careful That's with that. That's easy for we'll, you to say. Absolutely. Uh, we'll be going out and sort of finding out some of the stories that are happening and things that really do affect people uh, in the local area as well. So going out and finding out the things that affect seriously, like you and me on a day-to-day -day basis. Do you still continue with the radio programme? Every morning. So if you'd like to join me tomorrow morning on 96.4 FM from Radio Mercury, I'll catch you between 6 and 10. The inevitable That's the plug. plug. <laughs> what time do you have to get up for a 7 o'clock programme? Around about half past 4. 
<laughs> we're on air at six. We're on air at six. Right. So it's a fairly early start. And what sort of music, what, what style of music are you playing these days? Uh, target audience, technically speaking, 25, uh, 25 to 45 year olds. So you're looking at anything from Dire Straits, Phil Collins, uh, all the way through to today's pop charts. Wow, what a all man. Up, mate, uh, all right. Uh, all right. Uh, but we go back, back a long, there. long way to the world of um, hospital radio, don't we? That's right, in West London, Radio St. Bernard's, as it was then. And, uh, Hard radio work, no money. A bit like here, right, really. Like here, really, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> what can you say? Walk what away, say? walk away, I think. I think. Well, we look forward to all your reports coming up, Steve, and thanks very much for joining us in the studio today. Maybe we'll do a double header one in, in here one day. What do you think? Look forward to it. Yeah, let's do that. Thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, if clicking the shutter on your box brownie is as energetic as you ever get, you might want to go along to the Windsor Photographic Group's biannual exhibition. It's open from Valentine's Day, that's Monday the 14th of February, from 7 o'clock in the evening, and that's the official formal opening. And thereafter, it'll be open every day until March the 19th. The exhibition, comprising over, of over 100 black and white and colour prints, is open to the public at the Exhibition Gallery at the Windsor Arts Centre. That's located at the Old Court, St Leonard's Road, Windsor. For more information, you can contact Alan Cross on 0753 863 573. Now, with his monthly guide to what's new, what's hot and what's not in films and video, here comes Terry Adlam and Susanna with Terry Vision. Steve, he's a lad, isn't he? He's just come back from a skiing holiday in Switzerland, actually. He was walking down the road and he asked this passerby, he said, excuse me, could you tell me where the ski slopes are? And the passerby said, I'm sorry, I'm a tobogganist. He said, that's all right, I'll have a packet of cigarettes and a Mars bar then. Ha <laughs> ha, enough of that, enough of that. Let's get on with this. Hello and welcome to Terry Vision. And what have we got this month for you? Well, we have ace film reviewer Susanna Green here, who's been to see... A Perfect World, Malice and Adam's Family Values. And I've also seen another stakeout. We've also got some videos, some gossip, some competitions. Oh, is there enough hours in the day? Oh, Let's find out. And you smile. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here we are with Susanna Green, who's uh, been to the movies. So what have you seen this month? Well, the first film I saw this month was A Perfect World. And I'm a bit of a girly when no, it comes no. to... I am, Would you believe really, that? Oh, I don't know. I am. When it comes to my choice in films. And I wasn't really looking forward to seeing a Clint Eastwood. I thought, Western, Cowboys, Macho, Guns. Yeah, right. yeah, I thought, no, I don't want to see it. But I went with my boyfriend and I absolutely loved it. It's a real case of never, never ever judge a book by its cover because there's lots of moving mushy bits in there which will appeal to it's very stereotypical but appeal to boys and girls so what's it basically about it takes the form of a suspense drama as well as a kind of Thelma and louise type road movie mm -hmm. and it's about a villain called butch haynes who's played, played by, by kevin costner now that's unusual because he's always playing the hero isn't he absolutely he's yeah he plays a villain in this piece but it's not it's he's not a normal villain because he's a man who's been very scarred by his past his mother was um a prostitute his father I think abandoned him or um, beat him up or something like that and so he's a man who's got a lot of hurt inside and actually it transpires that during the course of the film he takes his hostage under his wing and forms a very moving father-son relationship so with what, him. So what would you give that out of ten? Uh, seven and a half out of ten, it's very entertaining. Right, excellent. What else do you go and see? I went to see Adam's Family Values. Ah, I've seen this, I've yep. seen this. Now, uh, What did you think? I thought it was sick. <laughs> really? <laughs> I thought it was very, very funny, but it, it's a PG, isn't it? Yeah. And I was most surprised because I thought some of the, some of the humour in it... A bit dodgy but, yeah. bits for PG, yeah. It's um, slightly better than its predecessor, I thought, The Adam's Family. Um, but again, there's a new arrival called Baby Pubert, and the whole of the plot involves trying to cut his head off, drown him, electrocute him, do absolutely really Don't nasty things. Don't try this thing. at home, please. No. Very nasty yeah. things to the baby, to the extent that they have to employ a nanny to ensure the survival of this baby. But it turns out that the nanny's a serial killer, isn't she? And she has been employed because she's seen, who is it, Uncle Fester? Uncle Fester, Chris, Uncle Fester. played by Christopher Lloyd yep. from Back to the Future, yep. In the, the lives of the rich and freakish or something, and she decides to marry him so that she can inherit all his wealth and all this stuff. Um, and she dispatches the two older children off to summer camp, and for me, that's the best bit in yeah, the Yeah, I, 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 I think the, the young girl for me was the Absolutely star, star of the show. Absolutely brilliant. It's worth so, going to so see So what would you give her. that out of ten? I'd give that eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. Yeah. Better than Perfect World. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's right. funny, funny. Um, also, I went to see Malice. Did you see Malice? What did you think of it? I thought it was brilliant, Terry. Ten out of ten. Stunning. She told me on the phone recently it was a pile of poo. <laughs> and actually, I, I agree with it. It wasn't very Dyer, good, was it? it absolutely was, terrible. It was, uh... So we move on to something else. Absolutely. Um, I saw another stakeout. Now, did you see the original? I haven't seen it, no. Right, it stars Richard Dreyfuss.
and uh -huh. Emilio Estevez as two sort of surveillance guys. Um, if anybody saw the first one, it's not as thrilling as the first one, but it's much funnier. And yeah. there's some, some lovely, lovely, lovely um, uh, one-liners. It's great. And also, if you go and see it, look out for one of the most unusual camera angles that I've ever <laughs> seen. It's, it's where a dog is chasing a cat. I yeah. won't say no more, but go and have a look at it. Watch out for that one. So, what have you got lined up for next month? What do you think um, you're going to see? I'm definitely going to see Age of Innocence. Absolutely, definitely. This and the Mrs. Martin Doubtfire. Sort of, and Mrs. Doubtfire. I think we're both going along yep. to see Five Rob. Excellent reviews. Thank Excellent you. reviews. Thank you uh, much. That's about it. What, what do we do next? Stick on a caption, Doris. She's got it. OK, I've also been looking at some videos. Now, I've seen two videos this month, and they both star the big action heroes. Now, Susanna, I know you're not into big action films, but have you seen Last Action Hero? I haven't, I'm afraid, no. Last Action Hero stars Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's a great film. Now, I know you're not into action films, but take your brain out, put it in a pickle jar beside the television, okay. and watch it, because it's just pure fun. Now, I think if Jurassic Park hadn't come out when it did, I think this would have been the big film of the summer. It's great. Now, I know he's not... A great actor, old Arnie. Sorry if you're watching Arnie. Um, but he does take the mickey out of himself, St. Ron, and it's great, and it's great. It's really good. Um, excuse me. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I'm only acting. I ain't got anything here. Um, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. S Steve wants his tree back. Um, could, you, could you take... He loves that tree. He does. Oh, no. he, he, it's like a security blanket for him. OK. Absolutely. Another video I went out to see... Uh, well, I didn't go out. I brought it in. And that was Cliffhanger, starring Sylvester Stallone. No, I've seen it. No. no. Have you seen Dan Militia Man? No. No, you're not into I'm that. Sorry, are you? I'm sorry. Right. No, I'm a girly. You're a girl. I'm She's a girly. a girly. She's a girl. Great film. Lots of action. Um, some wonderful stunts. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're frightened of heights, don't go to <laughs> see it because what takes place on top of these mountains is unbelievable. Mm. Um, supposed to be set in the Rocky Mountains, but apparently they weren't dangerous looking enough, so they went to Italy and filmed it in Italy. Not a lot of people know that. So, that's the two videos, and I recommend both of them if you want a, a good time, a good evening out with a beer and a, a chips and something. It's a great evening out. OK, and talking of videos, I get my videos from the video box, Elmshot Lane, sipping them. And this is their top ten. OK, here's the top ten from the video box in Elmshot Lane, Sippenham. At number ten is The Body Snatchers, The Invasion Continues, which is a remake of the remake of the remake. At number nine, Hubby and Whiffy Team of Don Johnson and Melanie Griffiths, starring Born Yesterday. Bill Murray has starring roles in both number eight, Mad Dog and Glory, and at number seven with the very enjoyable Groundhog Day. At number six, Michael Douglas has still got the right hump in Falling Down. The Vanishing with Keith Sutherland is at... Uh, number five and is another remake. Uh, he may be passenger 57, but Wesley Snipes is at number four in the Sippenham branch of the video box. Arnie is the last action hero and is back in the top three at number three. And number two has Bridget Fonda doing her bit in The Assassin, which, yes, you've guessed it, is a remake. And still hanging there, number one is Man Mountain Sylvester Stallone in Cliffhanger. Phil, Phil, come here, come, 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 come here. There's two more videos being released this month, and it's Clint Eastwood in The Line of Fire and Hot Shots Do, which is an excellent sequel to Hot Shots. Now, I've got two free posters to give away, and Susanna's showing them here. The poster is for Clint Eastwood, Line of Fire, and Hot Shots Do. Now, right, back to me, here you go. Right, now the question for the Clint poster is, in the film he plays the bodyguard to which ex-president. I should repeat that. He was the ex-bodyguard of which ex-president, OK? And in Hot Shots 2, you have Charlie Sheen, whose dad is Martin Sheen. Who is Charlie Sheen's famous brother? He was in another stakeout, and his name begins with Emilio. Right, OK, send uh, your answers in to the usual address, and uh, the posters will be winging their way to you very soon. OK, let's get out the pencils and do another caption. <laughs> OK, welcome to Chimwag, where we look at what's going on in the cinema world. Now, how's this for a family feud? Ilya Sulkin and his father Alexander are famous for being the producers of the Christopher Reeve Superman movies. Now, son Ilya is suing dad Alexander for ten million dollars. Ten, ten, I know, I, I know, I know, I know. I know. Uh, apparently, it's over a few million dollars. Well, exactly six point seven million dollars, actually. That uh, Ilya's wife lent her father-in-law. 6.7 million. Thanks for having that to lend. I don't know. Right. She lent it to him so he could make uh, that flop of a film, Christopher Columbus, The Discovery. And apparently father-in-law hasn't paid it back yet. So where does the other 3.3 million come from, I hear you say? Well, 
Where is yeah. the other three books? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. We do it every month. We do it every month. Well, apparently they're now suing him for damages. Suing these dad for damages. Now, if I did that to my dad, the only damages I would get would need hospital treatment. Take it out of his pocket money. That's what I say. Take it out of his pocket money. Yeah. Okay, right. The continuing search for a new 007. Is Timothy Dalton going to do it or not? A lot of names been bandied about. Not mine yet, but I'm sure it will be there soon. Another one who's been put forward is Kenneth Branagh. Kenneth Branagh as James Bond. It won't be as much as 007, more like 00 Loveys. OK, right, we spoke about the Adams Family values, and today in the studio we have a guest from that film. Not Angelica Houston or Raul Julio. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome Thing. Thank you. Welcome to the show. It's, it's really great you come along. Uh, did you enjoy working on this big blockbuster? Great, great. Uh, did you have a hand in writing the scripts? You didn't, right. OK. Uh, now, I did hear a bit of scandal here, a bit of scandal involving you and some backhanders. Is this true? Right. Oh, the movie business, I don't know. Now, is it true when you left the film you was given a golden handshake? It was brilliant. Right, it's been great having you here. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have a hand for the hand. Bring on the next caption. Right, it's competition time. Now, do you remember this from last month? The competition. It's what has the genie in Aladdin, the genie in Aladdin, Thompson the cat from the Thompson directory adverts, and those hippopotamuses dancing on the mooses cartoon things in the, on the telly. What have they got in common? And I don't... Well, it looked like that question was a bit too hard for all of you out there because nobody won. Well, in fact, nobody entered. So no one won the popcorn with the special prize of £30,000. Not really. <laughs> it was two free tickets to the MGM Cinema in Slough, uh, worth £7.50, but still a great prize. And I do apologise for the question. It was a bit hard. Um, who drew Genie and Aladdin, Thompson the Cat and the Dancing Hippos? It was, in fact, a man by the name of Mr Eric Goldberg. I should imagine the only person who knew that was his mum, Mrs Goldberg. So this week's competition is much, much easier. Uh, a few minutes ago, we spoke about Malice, starring Nicole Kidman and Alec Baldwin. Now, what I want to know is, who is Nicole Kidman married to? Who is her hubby? That's not very difficult, because you've only got a few good men to choose from, haven't you? Now, send your entries into Terry Vision, mark the postcard uh, competition time, and what we'll do is we'll put all the entries into a pair of uh, Simon Brandt's old underpants, pick out the winners, and they can have two free tickets to go to the cinema in February to see whatever film they like. And if they want, they can come in and tell me all about the film that they saw. Uh, yep, that's about it. OK, usher forth the last, the very last caption, please. Well, that's about it from Terry Vision for this month. I'd like to thank Susanna for her wonderful film reviews. I'd also like to thank Mark at the Video Box in Sippenham and all at the MGM Cinema in Slough. Now, next month, you won't do yourself no harm by popping into the flicks and having a look at Mrs Doubtfire, starring Robin Williams, not Robert, as I said earlier. Sorry about that, Robin, if you're watching. <laughs> not. Uh, also, you're going to go and see Age, Age of, of Innocence. Innocence. And there's also Wayne's World 2, Heaven and Earth and Carlito's Way. Now, also, if you're popping in the video shop, uh, take a look at uh, Mad Dog and Glory and Groundhog Day, because they uh -huh. both star Bill, Bill Murray. Murray. And that's about it. Right, we'll go back to Steve Brennan, who was once a stuntman on Trumpton. <laughs> actually, it wasn't Trumpton. I was a lifeguard on Rosie and Jim. Uh, Terry can talk, actually. He was formerly a hairdresser on The Riddlers. He still is. Um, getting quite bitchy around here, wouldn't you say? You're watching Scene on 7. It's 25 minutes past the hour and time for a break. We'll be back very soon, so stay tuned to WMTV. For your holiday away from the crowds, our nine-bedroom villa has its own swimming pool, tennis court and billiards room, and is available for room or whole villa rental. Situated on the Portuguese west coast, three minutes from the beach, with three golf courses within 40 minutes drive. And, of course, there's the renowned Portuguese food. For brochure or video, call Eaton Travel on 0753 671747. Ideal home, superstar. Whatever you're looking for to finish your house, look no further than the... Ideal home, superstar. In our giant store on the Bath Road, Sippenham, the choice just has to be seen to be believed. 
with interest-free credit on some items, this is the ideal place. And don't forget, the South East's biggest furniture sale begins on the 27th of December. 388 to 389 Bath Road, just off Junction 7. It's the ideal... Welcome back. And this week's update on 7 focuses on underage smoking, particularly with reference to traders. Traders caught selling cigarettes to under-16s will now face prosecution. Berkshire County Council has warned everyone of this. The crackdown follows the result of surveys carried out by the Trading Standards Office last August when it was found that more than half of the 50 shops surveyed would sell cigarettes to a child aged 13 to 14. Trading Standards Officers will now be carrying out a further survey of Berkshire with the help of a team of teenage volunteers who will make test purchases in newsagents, supermarkets, general stores and kiosks. David Comburn, Acting County Trading Standards Officer, said, We have carried out extensive campaigns to educate retailers in the belief that prevention is better than cure. We now believe that the results of the survey justify us in taking a firm stand against traders who continue to flout the law. We will prosecute shopkeepers where we have evidence. The County Council has the power to prosecute under the new Children and Young Persons Protection from Tobacco Act 1991. There's a maximum fine of £2,000. That should worry them. The law requires the Council to consider at least once a year how it will carry out an enforcement programme, including all or any of the following. Bringing prosecutions, investigating complaints, taking measures to reduce the incidences of offences and monitoring the use of vending machines. And so, traders, beware, you have been warned. And kids, do yourselves a huge favour and don't start smoking, then you won't have to stop. That's the end of update for this week. Well, we've got a New England manager, lots of sport on the horizon, so very best of luck to Terry Venables. And to find out what else is happening in the exciting world of sport, here with this week's Sport on 7 is Andre Moradian. Andre. Thanks very much indeed, and you got my name right as well this week. I thank know, you very thank much you. indeed. Hello, and welcome to this week's Sport on 7. Once again, football is in the news this week with Slough Town in the Vauxhall Conference League topping the headlines. They were saved from demolition in Tuesday night's game against Welling by a diving header from Andy Sayer in the 72nd minute, but were sadly beaten resoundingly 4-1 by Telford last Saturday. I think we'll draw a veil over this result. Also, only 650 people showed up to watch a pretty dismal match in pretty horrible conditions and witnessed, witnessed what was nothing more than a desperate first half, saved slightly by the second half um, by the goal from Sayers, which was swiftly, swiftly answered by another at the other end from Wellings' Terry Robbins. He scored his first goal in seven league games. This 1-1 draw finishes the current losing run of three and gives them a much-needed point and hopefully will put them in the right frame of mind for their game away against Merthyr Tidville on Saturday. Elsewhere, Windsor and Eton also took Tooting and Mitcham to a draw at Stag Meadow on Saturday. They took the lead in the eighth minute after a fumble by Tooting and Mitcham's goalkeeper. This allowed Keith Boreham to slam home the goal. An extra celebration for Boreham, whose wife had just given birth to a bouncing baby daughter the previous evening. Tooting replied just 11 minutes later with a close-range shot from Tompkins. It was a well-deserved draw from a match played on a difficult surface against a much higher-placed side. In other matches, Burnham lost 1-0 to Erith and Belvedere, whilst Burnham Reserves did rather better, beating Ab Abingdon Town Reserves 3-1. Burnham are currently lying in 17th place in the Southern Deodora League. Fixtures to watch out for this week are as follows. On Saturday, Slough are away to Merthyr Tidville in the Vauxhall Conference League. Ricelip Manor are entertaining Windsor and Eton in the Deodora League Division 1. And Burnham play away at Sudbury Town on Tuesday in the Deodora Southern Division. As the entire WMTV region doesn't just rely on sport, on football for its sporting kicks, here's a roundup of other sports over the last week. Rugby and Slough were beaten 21-0 by a superior Bracknell team who are unbeaten since November. This proved to be a very difficult game for Slough and ended in an injury tally covering most of the squad, particularly poor Peter Clark, who unfortunately broke his nose when he tried to stop a Bracknell player's knee with it. Nevertheless, Slough fought bravely, but were unable to make a serious impression on the Bracknell squad. Incidentally, um, Bracknell are now coached by former Slough and England player Paul Rendell. Penns had a rather better day, beating the Drifters by 10 points to 6. I would say actually probably more time spent in training and less time singing under the ballpark would have resulted in a better scoreline for the American famous songsters. 
I'd just like you to spot the deliberate mistake in that report. Um, of course, the Drifters actually are a rugby team. Windsor put up a brave fight, were unable to beat Taunton, who cruised to a 32-11 win. And finally, the Taplow rugby side, Phoenix, beat Chesham 24-18 in the last of their non-league fixtures and kept their unbeaten record against the first division side. A quick look at ice skating now, and Slough Jets had excellent results this week, first of all beating the Solar Hull Barons 7-4, and then beating the Romford Raiders a solid 13-6, which keeps the Slough Jets firmly at the top of the league table. We will be having further and more in-depth coverage of the, re the region's ice skating in the weeks to come. On to athletics, and we've had some local talent, for want of a better phrase, on the international scene this week, with four athletes from Windsor, Slough and Eton Athletics Club in action at Kelvin Hall in Glasgow over the weekend. This was at the Great British, I <laughs> beg your pardon, Great Britain versus Russia Indoor International. Mark Richardson won the 400 metres in his second best ever time of 46.11 seconds, beating teammate Duane Ledejo into second place. The women's 60 metres was dominated by the Russians, with Marcia Richardson in third place in 7.41 seconds and Jackie Agyapong taking fourth place. Michelle Griffith was beaten in the triple jump by Hounslow's Rachel Kirby with a jump of 13.31 metres this is. The event was finally won by a Russian, clearing over 14 metres. Other athletics news now, and about 30 members of the Burnham Joggers, who were incidentally featured in Scene on 7 last year, were involved in the Mizuno Today's Runner cross-country league on Sunday. With a waterlogged course making the going extremely heavy, the race proved to be a tough one. Lee Zone overcame everything the elements could throw at him and was the first Burnham man home in third place. Reading Roadrunners were eventual winners in the men's section, winning easily with Burnham running out, <laughs> excuse the pun, an eventual fourth. Burnham ladies also took fourth place. Well, that's about it for this week. Once again, don't forget to keep your eyes on the moving magazine for our address here at WMTV, and let us know if you have an interesting sporting event or story you want covered. I'll be back next week with another regional roundup, but until then, it's back to Steve in the hot seat. The very hot seat. <laughs> Extremely hot seat. Listen, what do you think is going to happen with this uh, Five Nations Championships in the rugby? Well, I have to say I'm a little bit biased, but I think I'm of the same opinion of you. France. <laughs> <laughs> With a name like mine. Andre eh? Mordieu, no, it's very Abs good. Eh? Absolutely more. Um, Absolutely. No, I think uh, England is going to run out winners. Yeah, favourites because of the defeat of the All Blacks, or...? I think it's got to be, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. What about you? You're on my side? Yeah, sneaking suspicion about the French. They're always tough to beat, and, and you know, it's just one of those. It's one of those. It's one of those. <laughs> very tough one to call. It's going to be a tough game, but I think we're in for a lot of good competition over this uh, coming We'll know tournament. by... What, what day does it finish? Do you, do you remember? You've got me there. I couple have to weeks, check out. It's a couple of weeks. Four weeks yeah. Ago. Anyway, thanks, Andre. Thanks a lot. Sport on Seven. As you know, you'll be reading the newspapers lately, no doubt, and you have definitely been watching Scene on Seven. I know for a fact. If you have, then uh, you've probably read of some alarming increases in crime in the area. As ever, our own Thin Blue Line has been casting a concerned eye over it all. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Nick Wood and Inspector Bob Owen with the all-new Police File. This is Police File from Scene on Seven. Hello, my name's Bob Owen, and our first programme for 1994 comes from the Ashford Police Office in Church Road, Ashford. Please have a pen and paper ready, as we have a number of crimes that we'd like you to help us solve. But first, a reminder about our local bike thief. This criminal likes to steal bikes, particularly from garden sheds. He was busy a few days ago when he stole three in as many days. One from a very secure police officer's shed. So be aware that he's about. So keep your shed padlock and keep small attractive items indoors. Pen and paper ready. We've got three cars for you that have been stolen in January. Do you know where they are? Note down the numbers and ring us on 0784 421 409. The cars are a gold Ford Fiesta, KBX 803X, a dark blue Ford Sierra five-door A131FLN and a white Austin Maestro F957EFD. If you know where they are, ring us now on 0784 
421 409. Were you in the Colnebrook Industrial Estate on Tuesday the 18th of January at half past one? Did you see anybody around a red Audi 100? If you did, that criminal stole the Audi's radio cassette. He's about five foot ten inches tall with short ginger hair and he was wearing a denim jacket and blue jeans. Did he jump in a car? Where did he go? If you have any details to help us catch him, ring us now on 0784 421 409. And now over to Nick, who's looking for a witness for a fatal road crash. Nick. Thanks, Bob. This is the Volkswagen Scirocco, which was involved in the fatal accident last Thursday night, that's the 27th of January, at about 10 to 6 in the evening. After the accident, the damage on the vehicle was very serious, as you can see. The headlights have been broken, and there's damage on the bonnet, and more damage above the windscreen. The accident has happened, as I say, in, on the A30 London Road. This vehicle was being driven London-bound from the Crooked Billet roundabout towards Ashford Hospital. A pedestrian was crossing the road from the, the north side, we believe heading towards Avondale Road. Were you in the area at the time of this accident? We understand that the weather was absolutely appalling. There was high winds and a lot of rain at the time. If you saw anything, perhaps the pedestrian or the vehicle before the accident, then we'd like to hear from you to help us piece together how this accident happened. Please contact us straight away on our telephone number 0784 421 409. Bob. Thanks, Nick. Were you in the Shaftesbury Crescent area in Laleham late on Monday the 24th of January? Did you see a group of youths with lots of beer? They may have stolen them from a local resident's garage. DC Casson is investigating. So if you have any leads, ring us now on 0784 421 409. DC Casson needs help on this crime. Can you help PC John Lane, who is flying about trying to solve a theft? Sometime during January, on the Thursday the 27th, somebody broke in uh, a lock on a cage in Ashford, Middlesex, and stole four birds. Not racing pigeons, but two crimson-winged parakeets and two mealy rosellas. The parakeets are predominantly green and the rosellas yellow. So if you know of somebody's cage that's suddenly perching 800 pounds worth of multicolored bird, give John a ring on 0784 421 409. The last item today is the Bumblebee Roadshow. This is a display of stolen goods that we've taken from burglars and other criminals and we display for owners to come and claim. So if you have quality goods stolen that were untraceable, why not pop along to the Richmond rooms next to Richmond British Rail Station on the 12th, 13th and 14th of February. We've recovered quite a lot. Yours could be there. That's all for this edition of Police File from Nick and myself. And now back to Steve in the studio. Steve. Thank you very much, Bob. Incidentally, many congratulations to our own Andrew Barron, who directed that particular piece. Police file back better than ever, I think you'll agree. Now, the government have introduced a charter for citizens, a charter for British Rail, and now a charter for the police. To discuss this further with me, I'm joined by Commander Clive Pearman, Support 5 Area Metropolitan Police. Welcome, sir. Good evening, sir. Nice to welcome to you. Um, is it fair to say that the, the charter for the Metropolitan Police is a guide for the police to live by? It's more than a guide. It actually focuses our role, it focuses our effort, and gives us that accountability with the public about the, not only the, what we should be doing, but how we should be doing it, which is, I think, most important. One of the key objectives I've got written down here is that 75% of all 999 calls should be answered within 12 seconds. Now, we all know the constraints you're under, financial, manpower, etc. Is that a realistic objective? It's challenging very challenging because if you appreciate that policing is going on 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, a variety of calls, a variety of incidents that police get called to and you've only got a certain number of police officers. So being able 
to meet that particular target is a very challenging one. Could you tell me and uh, also the other viewers about some of the other key objectives of the Charter and, and how it would affect the, the members of the public? Yes, certainly. Uh, it's about focusing on how we deliver that service to the public, certainly on our responding to the telephone calls, responding to incidents, to actually be there within 12 minutes of someone calling for police. It's the way and the speed in which we turn correspondence around so that the person isn't left wondering what's happened to the letter that they wrote. It's dealing with people who attend police stations, giving a service to the victims of crime. All of these areas get captured by the Charter. So it covers virtually every single aspect of police work? The most important aspects where police officers are in contact with members of the public. Right. So from an interactive point of view, it's, it's obviously it's a guide from top to bottom. It is, and everybody's behind it, everybody's supporting it. It's number one priority in the strategy that we're adopting for the 1994-1995 year, meeting our charter standards and actually going beyond them. I see. Now, the charter came into effect in October, um, and how does that affect local uh, divisions? I mean, it, for example, are there any figures available? Yes. I think the most important point is this is all about local police officers delivering a police service to local members of the community. So it's actually focused on Spellthorne, Hounslow, Chiswick. Uh, and being able to monitor just how people are perceiving the way that police officers react to them and treat them. And how does the Charter affect the citizens' rights, for example, um, where a complaint to the police may be appropriate? Well, actually, I think it adds to their rights because now, certainly through leaflets which are available at e each police station and leaflets which we send out to all burglary victims, members of the public have an additional way of actually making their views known directly to the police service but not sending them through locally. These are sent to New Scotland Yard, treated in total confidence and the moment a, p a member of the public is dealt with by a police officer they have an opportunity of saying, hey, I thought this was excellent or perhaps not so good. So you're, actually looking, you're actually looking um, directly for, for a response from the public? Yes. The more of these questionnaires that get completed, certainly the better the sample that we're dealing with, the more comprehensive, and it's allowing everybody that opportunity to make their views known. And would it be, f would it be accurate to say that uh, as a result of these questionnaires, the Charter could, for example, at one day be changed? We certainly would p push the standards higher. If, if, for example, we were to meet the targets that we've, we've set in the way that we deal with victims, and that target is 100%, although obviously we've got to get to that stage, we may change the standard. We may bring more aspects of that police response to the community into the Charter. Apart from that, what other steps can the public uh, take to ensure that the, the Charter is a big success for them and for the police? Two things, I think. Firstly, is appreciate that providing a police service is a very difficult profession to be engaged in. We are treating it very seriously. We want to meet and we want to go beyond the Charter standards that we've set. And secondly, if members of the public, whenever they see one of these proformers and leaflets available, please complete it and send it in. Mm. I Commander Clark, we've taken up an awful lot of your time, uh, valuable time I know, and we're very grateful to you for sparing the time to come into the studio today. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Details of the policing charter, that is the charter for the Metropolitan Police, are available at any Metropolitan Police station. This is the document just here. And it's also available at any branch of the Citizens Advice Bureau. Now then, on a happier note, Valentine's Day is Monday the 14th of February. And we've been out and about getting your views about the big event. The romantic little gestures, which, let's face it, we should all be doing all year round. Even the pet names you call each other, believe me, they've been mentioned on screen. And you'll be seeing those all shown during Valentine's Week. But if you want to swear undying love to someone special or just send a really saucy message, we really like the saucy ones, you can do it absolutely free on the moving magazine. The address, as usual, at the end of the program. One thing that really annoys me about uh, Valentine cards, I don't know about you, are those that are unsigned. I mean, for God's sake, if you fancy someone, sign your name, put your phone number, enclose a photo. Who knows, it might work. Hope I get some. Well, one would be nice. There's a little gap just 
here for it. An unlikely recipe for a winning TV game show is a host who is bald as a badger and wears lycra leggings. I'm not doing that. Forcing perfectly nice people to chase through all sorts of nastiness to retrieve lumps of glass for one hour. However, the Crystal Maze has been very successful for Channel 4. First Leisure have built the Super Bowl and, as an additional piece, featured on Scene on 7, now you too can try out the Crystal Maze. Tony O'Rourke joined WMTV volunteers to try it out. Thanks, Steve. This week I'm at the Maidenhead Super Bowl. I've come down to see my old mate, Bowler the Bear, who's going to show me his new crystal maze. <laughs> This is the way in to the crystal maze. Spooky. The WMTV team. Hello, gang. What's happening? Hi, Tony. What's going on? We can't get in. We don't know how to get in. <sighs> can't get the staff anymore. <laughs> Follow me. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, interesting. Oh, amazing. Oh, Ben Williams, you're the general manager of the Super Bowl as a whole, which now, of course, includes the Crystal Maze. Ah, uh, that's right, Tony, uh, yes. So what is it about the Crystal Maze that's going to make people queue up to, to come in? Why do we want to have a go at the Crystal Maze? Well, hopefully it's because they've watched it on television, um, and it's a very similar game to the one on television, except that you're controlled by a computer rather than a bald-headed man running around in skin tights. <laughs> right, and you've got not just one game, but several. Yes, there's um, actually 20 different games in the game zone. Uh, four zones similar to the TV, uh, Aztec, Medieval and Oceanic. And you can play any number of those 20 games. And each time you visit the Crystal Maze, you'll be sent to a different game by the computer? Yeah, the computer picks the games out randomly per team. Uh, generally on a visit, you'll visit about five or six of those games. But it all depends on your speed and skill as to how many games you actually play. Right. How many people on a team? There's, you can have a minimum of two players and a maximum of six players per team. trade secret, but uh, basically it's just a network of computers, very ordinary personal computers, uh, which take the place of the Maze Master, the character uh, who leads the team around on the TV programme, Crystal Maze. It's not just like playing computer games, is it? No, uh, it's not just a series of games because each, com each game knows exactly who you are and where you've been before, how many games you've won and where to send you next. So it's like an intelligent com a series of intelligent computer games. You've got some quite physical games as well, haven't you? I've noticed you've got some ropes through there and you have to climb up to the ceiling and press a button. Yeah? That's right, yeah. Well, just like on the, uh, the television programme, we've got physical games and we've got mental games. Come on, let's go. Next one. That's it. Okay, so when, once you get to the end of the game, what do you win? Well, at the end of the game, you receive a certificate, and on the certificate, it gives you a team name and the amount of points you scored. Because the whole idea of the game is that as you're going around the games, you collect crystals, and each crystal's worth a value of time. That value of time then equates to how much time you get to spend in the Crystal Dome. While you're in the Crystal Dome, that's when you gain your points. Right, this is what I'm saying. Now you're going to play the final challenge. Prepare to play Crystal Dome. Trust me, it's this way. I'm sorry, it's definitely that way. It's definitely that way. Yes, here it is. Oh, hello. 
WMTV next uh, next time try expert level. Yeah. 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 Not bad. Good, good. This is Tony O'Rourke with the gang down at the Maidenhead Super Bowl and the Crystal Maze. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Another one for the Christmas tape, I think. Uh, lovely job as always. Tony O'Rourke dressed prematurely, but nevertheless resplendently for Henley. It's exactly five years ago that the lives of visitors to St Margaret's Church in Uxbridge were given a real boost. From the relaxed atmosphere of coffee mornings and live chat shows at lunchtime to the now infamous raves, the nave came to life. Like to know more? So would I. One man who has all the information we require is the Reverend Alistair Cutting from the Nave at St Margaret's Church in Uxbridge. Alistair, welcome to uh, Hello, WMTV. Sir. Nice to have you here. Now, according to government statistics, only 15% um, of the population are regular churchgoers, which is way below the average in most European countries. Why would you say that is? Um, I'm not quite sure why the, why the regulars are quite as low as that. Another statistic would be that 90% of people in this country believe in God. Uh, and so they, this, the Church of England fits a nice slot in actually working with those who are perhaps the part-time attenders at church. So are the projects that you've run consistently now over five years in the nave uh, designed to make people go back to church or just to find out more or do you run it in tandem with the normal um, celebration of uh, the Bible etc? Uh, it's very much in tandem with the church. Uh, the church of St Margaret's is still there. It is St Margaret's on a Sunday and during the week it becomes the nave. It has this sort of alternate personality if you like. Very alternate. Yeah. And it's really there to, to bring back into the heart of Uxbridge, something of the culture that was lacking five years ago when the nave was first opened. There wasn't even as much as a cinema open in Uxbridge. There was very little of culture there. And yet the church has traditionally had a, a role of sponsor of the arts. Tell me about the raves. I'm, I'm uh, astonished. I mean, I saw a little bit about it on, on Carlton's program, London Tonight, um, about a rave in the nave. For example, do you need to get permission from a higher authority? To, to host a rave in the name. I mean, not that high an authority, but you know the sort of Within church thing I'm talking about. No, no, it's very much up to us as a local church to decide what we want to do with our services. And we do that. Uh, we've been running them now for nearly a year. We've got another one coming up uh, around Easter time. And they're really very much celebrating God in the culture of today. Um, so that you've got a church that's full of stained glass windows. I think the modern equivalent of that is surely the television screen. And so we use that and live videos or whatever as part of the worship there. The music, well, yes, people still use organs and, and all that sort of older style of music. But a lot of people these days are using a very different style. So it's linking all that in together. Much more interactive as well. There's a lot more movement involved in the worship and rave style music. So it's really closely aligned to, to what's happening, let's say, in the gospel fraternity of churches. Now the, the gospel, for me personally, I mean I love gospel music, I think it's great, very soul based and that sort of very inspirational. In fact it's often called inspirational music. So why are those churches full every Sunday and then the sort of more staid traditional type of church half empty? Well, I think that uh, the, 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 sp it speaks for itself there, as you say, that there, there has to be something of a life there. Um, it's not just about what the outside looks like, though, if, uh, or the, what the outside of the, the services look like. It's much more actually to do with the spirituality of the inside. There is a lively sort of uh, style that carries on in many churches, um, but I, th I think most churches these days are actually going for a range of services. There are rave services at St Margaret's. There are completely quiet said services of traditional communion and all the rest of it. I think really the nave is, is a forerunner in that then, isn't it? I mean, have, have, has the nave led where others have followed? Um, not completely. Um, there have been other churches. The centre of London has got churches where they have become very famous for various things. Uh, St Martin in the Fields is very famous for the music that they put on. Uh, there's another one called uh, St Mary Le Beau, which does a lot of interviews. 
And so they, they're a bit like some of the things that we do. But as far as I know, the Nave has been one of the first churches to be involved in the full gamut of the arts and the, uh, the media. And it's great. I mean, for example, on the subject of interviews, I actually went along um, as a little bit of a, a research, my own research there, um, to see Stephen Fry interviewed. And it was very entertaining. It was a lunchtime. It's great. You get business people in there, mm -hmm. residents, as well as uh, visitors to Uxbridge. Um, among the other guests you've had, for example, in the film that's coming up at the end of the program today, Angela Rippon is featured. Mm -hmm. You've had Melvin Bragg. You've had Michael Heseltine. How do you go about choosing who to have for an interview? Well, we quite often actually try to find who are the movers and shakers of society and decide and to put them perhaps on the receiving end of the questions for a change. It was very nice to have Jeremy Paxman there a few months ago as well and actually ask him, what, what makes you tick? You are in the position to ask all sorts of very powerful questions of politicians. You in the media are in a position to actually direct what way the news actually begins to happen. So where are you coming from? What's in fact, your it is actually called on the receiving end, I That's believe. Right. Yes. Now, music plays a very important part in your schedule, uh, and this month I understand you've got quite a bit of music coming up. Um, what sort of things can we expect from the Nave in the near future? Well, we're actually coming up, as you say, to the fifth anniversary of the Nave. Uh, it was originally opened on the 17th of February 1989 by Margaret Thatcher, who was then Prime Minister. So we're celebrating the whole of the week, starting on Valentine's Day. We've got Vinus Swing Band, who are a local school-based swing band, who are going to have a... From uh, Ickenham. That's right, mm. Valentine's Night uh, soiree. Uh, we have got Helen Shapiro. Uh, the singer who's going to be coming and she's being interviewed uh, later this month. Um, so if you want to walk back to happiness, you need to uh, yes get down indeed. to the nave. <laughs> Uh, Martin Joseph, very famous uh, recently with a, a chart-hitting single. Certainly is. Mm. Well, Alistair, listen, thanks very much for coming in. Uh, if you want more information about the Nave, um, you can get one of these brochures. Yes, indeed. You can actually ask for these by ringing the Nave's phone number on 0895 812 193. We'll put you on our mailing list for the future ones. And I'm on it, and I get them every week. Thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, don't forget that directly after today's Scene on 7, you can find out more details, a more detailed look at the Nave in Andrew Barron's film. Now, if you have any comments or suggestions about WMTV or the programme, or you'd like to send us any Valentine messages for the team here, or for the Moving Magazine service, then please write to us at Scene on 7. WMTV PO Box 7 Slough SL3 6ET. I'll repeat that. Scene on 7 WMTV PO Box 7 Slough SL3 6ET. We'd love to hear from you. It only remains for me to thank my guests, Alistair Cutting, Steve Highland, and Commander Clive Pierman, for th taking the time out to come into the studio today. Thank you also to the fabulous crew here at WMTV. Hope you enjoyed the programme and that you can join me next week for Scene on 7. From me, Steve Brennan, goodbye. Don't forget, join us every evening at 5. The rest of the times are on the moving magazine service, which is available 24 hours a day. Bye for now.